I mean, welcome to B Talks. This is um, we've had so many of these in a row. I can't even imagine um, ever thinking about doing anything else on the second Thursday night of the month. I'm going to back up to July a little bit. Can everybody see that bloom calendar? Now, <clears throat> this is a species I added this year, narrow leaf thistle. And I, you know, I have to say with some um, appropriate shame that I missed this plant in all the years that I've um, actually been looking for blooming plants uh, in July and August. And this little guy is a thistle. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but honeybees really enjoy it. They work it like crazy. And, um, <clears throat> and it's all around. And it's not a real thistle thistle. It won't stick to you when you run through the woods. You know, it doesn't have any sticky stuff in it. Um, but it is a thistle in the, in the species of thistles. And it's a little, little tiny thistle plant blue uh, blossom. So I just wanted to go back and get that. I know there's a lot of Joe Pye weed around this year. I haven't seen a lot of um, uh, purple loose stripe, but there is some. And Calethra is out in full bloom. As you probably all know, you can smell it on the pathways. And, and, and there's my Korean BB tree, which I actually encourage you to plant one if you can find one. Logis, I think, has them up there, our friend. <clears throat> so you can watch one of those things grow. It takes about five years before it starts to bloom. And you all have plenty of time to do that. And then um, what you'll see is, a, is a, an, an incredible display this time of year when nothing else is really available. We're kind of like in that little transition between goldenrod and knotweed. Um, that BB tree will this year put out an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of sustained bloom. It's still bloom. It's been blooming for two weeks and it looks like there's a swarm on it every day. You go over there and every single blossom, and they're very small blossoms, and there's hundreds on each bloom head. And um, you can uh, watch bees just gorge themselves. Honeybees especially are attracted to it. There are some bumblebees that will go to it, but for the most part, it's a, it's a, it's a honeybee uh, plant. And uh, I'm really grateful for it this year because I think I'm stuck between goldenrod and knotweed right now. So there's, although the colonies are bringing back pollen and it doesn't seem like they're robbing a lot, um, it still seems like um, <clears throat> the baby tree is doing its job. All right, we also have dogbane that's been out for a while now. Dogbane um, is a sustainer blossom. Um, it's in the milkweed family, and it really does a good job of keeping our bees alive. Uh, when, when there's nothing, it won't produce a crop for you, but it's one of those plants in the variety of other plants that are, are out there, Joe Pye weed, loose strife, all the rest of them I've been naming. That in combination, they can give you a lot of food or enough food anyway, so your colonies don't starve out. Uh, let's see, greater burdock, that's a, oh, wing sumac too. That's a, if you've got a lot of wing sumac and jewelweed can be prolific and it is, especially in low lying areas where there's plenty of water, you'll have a lot of jewelweed, but jewelweed will grow anywhere in your backyard or anywhere, just look for it. It's a beautiful little plant, looks like an orchid. It's like orange colored orchid. And you can know your bees are working a jewelweed when they come back with a racing stripe down their back because the way the anther is set up in a jewelweed, <clears throat> for the bees to get nectar, and that's what they're primarily after in jewelweed, they have to crawl in and the anther go, puts a stripe right down their back. Now, um, jewelweed's an interesting plant because that anther then changes into um, a stigma. And that same plant will turn from male to female, blossom. And then uh, some of them will be male at that time, some of them will be female, and that's how the fertilization happens. It's a very, very interesting plant. And as I said, you can tell your bees are working it because they have that little racing strike down their back. Um, <clears throat> what else? I think that's it. Um, later on, in the month, you look forward to. Um, I have the balloon flowers out. They yeah, like balloon. those. Yeah, balloon. The white ones. You have white ones, or you have colored. Blue ones? and white. Yeah, and and they work them. You know. Yeah, you know, and they're all over my loose strife. 
Oh, where do you have flu strip? In West Hartford, oh, in the wetlands. A lot of it? A lot of it. Wow, so it's making a comeback because it's, you know, there's a biological, there's a beetle that they release and I think they released another uh, group of it. I, I want to check with the ag Here's, We have it here too, Bill, loose drive all around the pond. Yeah, I know, see it's- Tons of it. Yeah, um, so there's- It's beautiful, it's in my garden now. <laughs> oh, well, there's also blue vervain which is a different look-alike species. So make sure you identify that, loosestrife as the right species because they both grow in the same low-lying wet area. Vervain is just gorgeous too. And looks, I think loosestrife is a pretty plant too, but uh, no one else thinks that. And <clears throat> the biological I think has to be re-released every once in a while to get to get that loosestrife back under control. And the last, Two years, two years ago, I saw a tremendous amount of loose strife all over the place. We're in my area. So, you know, so I think it takes a while for the biological to get back up into population where it will control the plant again. But um, so I'm kind of encouraged that you guys are saying that there's some loose strife around because I think with the biological, we still get a crop of loose strife, a controllable crop that doesn't um, really get the environmentalists too excited. And um, and it gives us a little bit of bee forage when its replacement, Phragmite, does nothing. You know, you can't even uh, make a good basket out of Phrag Phragmite. It just sits there and covers the ground and does nothing. So I mean, that was the trade-off we made um, when we when we eradicated loose drive. Now, um, I wanted to also mention that I'm hearing rumors that they're bringing in or field testing or in trial <clears throat> for a biological that will attack knotweed, right? So yeah. that should be really interesting because knotweed is probably the most stubborn plant on the, in our, a, as an invasive, it's the most stubborn plant that we have. It just will not die no matter almost, you have to dig a big hole and you, and cover the roots with cement. And then in the process of digging that, loose um, knotweed will sprout and grow from any little particle of root, stem, and even leaf that you scatter on the ground. So it's not something- You mean Japanese knotweed? What did I say? Knotweed. But there's other night, well, knotweed. You're talking about the little grass, the Japanese knotweed? Yeah, Japanese, no. I'm talking about right. knotweed. Yeah, it's Japanese, but not, it's not a little grass. You're thinking of something else, Ralph. You're thinking about the big knotweed plant. No, but eight, eight inches, 10 inches high. Same one, yeah. 10 inches high? No, it grows to be uh, 10 feet high. Mm -hmm. Different, oh. plant. Different plant. Different plant. Yeah. You're talking about regular common Japanese knotweed. Yeah, there's Japanica. There's a couple of different uh, varieties of it. I think okay. we... Go no. ahead. Yes. I think he's thinking of Japanese stilt grass. Yes. Yeah, yeah. stilt grass. Yes, you're right. Yeah, My we, mistake. Yeah. We, no, we have to take it up. We have to take it easy on Ralph because because <clears throat> he's been in California for a while now, and you know that's that can uh, that can affect <laughs> you know California. Not not. It's, it's yeah. a poppy field, I mean, That's its problem. <laughs> yeah, I know. So you know, it could it could affect your memory, and and you know, you lose a little. I don't know, what is it, what, what would you say? Maybe it's the smoke out there, who knows, you know. Good. All right, so anyway, um, Paul, take it away. What are the events? Well, let's see, on the, on the 19th at 9 a.m., we have the late season hive inspection workshop. Okay, let me just say it, let's just, let me just say a word about that before you go on, okay. right? Don't miss it, we're gonna be, um, uh, I'm gonna show you the results of Formic Pro. On a lot of on a lot of uh, colonies, and I'm going to show you the results of what happens when you put Formic Pro on a colony and it's too hot. So you'll be able to see um, that sort of um, interesting development. So, and then we will do a we'll do a roll, and then we'll evaluate colonies for going into the winter. And I'll show you a brand new Australian hive that comes as a condensing colony. It's called the Hive IQ. And I'll have it ready set up with a colony in it surviving and you'll be able to see what the latest and greatest 
um, insulated colony hive looks like. So go ahead, Paul. Okay, so please register for the, uh, for the workshop. And we also have on the 24th of August, a uh, presentation by Dr. Lewis Bartlett, Controlling Parasites in the Hive, uh, 6.30. Also, uh, please register. And then that's it for August. Um, and then we go to September 14th with B Talks. Okay. So we'll review that again um, September. in September, which is coming to a close. I will be in um, Santiago, Chile for the April Monday event at the end of at the end of the month. And um, I'll bring back a report from there also because there there will be an incredible amount of hive bodies from all over the world. And they have condensing boxes that they're making for us to use as beekeepers. Uh, in addition um, to that, let's see, um, at, yeah, you might have missed EAS this year if you did. I know Michael was there. I, I'm sure Michael, did you get anything out of it this year, Michael? I missed uh, the last day, but a lot of things our club Backyard Beekeepers has actually had a lot of that stuff presented. Yeah. That's where we get our speakers from. So it kind of <laughs> makes sense. So, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Kurt yeah, Webster I'm, was there. You know, he uh -huh. did, Kurt, Webster, Kurt Webster was there. Yeah, but I've seen him like three, four times already. So I know. Yeah. But for people who've never gone to an EAS, you should try to make one next year's in Maryland. Yep. And, um, if you haven't been around for um, decades like Michael has, and you haven't gone to an EAS, I, I highly recommend it because um, you can get a lot out of them, especially for new beekeepers. All right, let's, what do we got? So let me see what we got here. I'm gonna stop this share screen and I'm gonna deal with the first question I got. Let me start first of all with the old comb question. So here's some black comb now. Um, can you see that? Yep. yep. Okay, so um, I think this comb here is a pretty good example of a comb that has probably been in your colony long enough. Now, um, I want you to understand that no matter where you think you are and no matter how much care you've put into having your colonies build their own wax, your wax will have in it Pestis, a pesticide load. And, you know, you can hear reports from people who would swear to you that there are no other bees um, in any area where they keep bees and they start with all new comb, they get their comb analyzed for pesticides and they find out that all of the major fluvalinates and, um, and um, other poisonous uh, pesticides from years ago, decades ago, Resist at low levels. They insist they they exist in their wax at low levels, not even toxic levels, but they're there. So, in time, your combs will gain some load, some pesticide load, some maybe even some um, fungicides, anything that is lipo uh, <clears throat> anything that has an oil base will get in because your comb is a carbohydrate just a stable one. So that's the same as any any oil. So anything that has oil base in it and our early, all of our early pesticides that we used inside bee colonies had oil based products in them and they go inside the comb and they reside in comb, they stay there. Um, there's also a buildup of cocoons, even though I think you might all know that once a, a, a bee cell is capped, it it's capped in its fifth in star and it, it's a pre-pupa at that point. And at that point, it's salivary glands can actually make silk. Later on, of course, they change their uh, function and they make saliva and other enzymes that bees use. That's where invertase comes from. But anyway, while it's while their glands are uh, salivary gland, um, excuse me, while their salivary glands are making cocoons, they spin a cocoon around themselves, right? So for, for the rest of the time that a bee is under a cap, 
let's say a worker bee from day nine to 21, they're inside a cocoon. But by the way, inside that cocoon is the varroa also. The varroa doesn't stay in the cell. It attaches to the bee. So when the bee spins a cocoon, it's inside there with it. And that's the, that's the horrible part about the way varroa do things. So anyway, um, then, then the first job of a bee after it emerges from the cell is to go in and clean other cells and even its own. But um, the fact is they can't do as thorough a job as they would like. They polish the cell, take as much of the detritus that's in there out before the queen gets in there and lays another egg. But the cocoon essentially stays. And um, <clears throat> is only partially removed or just thinned out. So if you think about it over generation and generation, uh, that comb gets narrower and the cell gets smaller and it gets really black looking because that's the way the um, silk and, and, the, and the detritus in the cell um, look, uh, change color to comb. So if you look at this comb here that I've got up on the screen, it's black, tarred, and if you were to look up close, you'd see cells that are um, really small or smaller than new comb that you might be able to compare it with. And I'm suggesting that this comb's probably been, been in this colony for you know three to five years. Um, and if you have testing facilities, you could of course test your comb, but you don't have those facilities and to get your comb tested cost a fortune. So you won't do that, but um, you can just start to rotate it out. Now, how do you do that? Well, if you're running double deeps, it's easy because you can have your, you can look at your comb in, in the bottom box in the springtime, your bees will probably come through and they'll be in the top box um, and they'll be living in there on their honey. And um, there probably is not much activity in the bottom box. That's a good opportunity for you to take out old comb and then um, do what you want with it. Replace the foundation in there, throw the whole thing out, put brand new comb in, and so on and so forth. That's how you rotate them out. You move your old comb toward the edge of your colony, and then you take it out. All right. So um, any anybody can add anything to that? Hey, Bill? Yeah. When I first started beekeeping, I went to the bee yard and I was amazed how big my bees were compared to the ones at the bee yard. And it took me a while to figure out that I had brand new foundation and they probably had five, 10 year old comb at the bee yard. Yeah. So um, the interesting thing about the biology of bees, is, as Mike was pointing out, is the bees get smaller as the cell gets smaller. I mean, they can't really grow any bigger than the cell they're in. And, and even if a, if your if your queen stops her ability to be able to be fertile, for some reason she runs out of sperm or something happens to her and she lays uh, unfertilized eggs in worker cells, the drones that come out of there are small. <laughs> they're cute little guys, but they're um but they're 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 much smaller than regular drones. So yeah, so as your comb ages, that's another thing that happens, your bees get smaller. All right. So real quick, let me just add to that. So from experience, I lost a number of hive last, last year due to this right here that you're showing. Um, I failed to realize just how much I had in several hives of this, this black comb uh, to the point of when I was doing um, inspections uh, later in the year, I realized that there was no queen, there were no eggs. I tried to combine the hive as much as I could and failed, unfortunately. So be mindful, guys, of that comb. Be on the lookout for it because the bill's point, it's it's not going to do you any good and replace it. Right. Cool. Um, I have a question. Sure. Sorry. Uh, it, can you do anything with that black comb? Can you make it into candles or you just have to throw it out like it's all gross? So you can you can try to melt it. Jamie, and what'll happen is you'll get a really dark, ugly wax from it, you know, and then you can continue to filter it for as long as you want. It'll never get to that nice, beautiful um, yellow uh, wax, although it will look like it's going in that direction. It just won't get there. So brood comb does not make good candle wax. Your, your best 
wax that you get out of the colonies from cappings that you take off of of supers when you're you're shaking your head so I guess you know that part right yeah I just I feel bad throwing it out it feels like I, I don't know it's so there's nothing you can do with it. Just throw it in the garbage. I used to. I, what I used to do is take the. Um, I used to take the. Well, by the way, a five year or ten year old frame doesn't owe you anything. <laughs> At that point, it's been you know really productive in your colony. But I used to take and put new foundation in them. Now I toss them all, wooden all, because I don't know. Um, I'm learning <clears throat> to be more conservative or more, um, yeah, more conservative in my judgment about what pathogens reside in the colony. And I don't know what's in that wood either. So I throw it all away and start new. Okay, thank you. The other thing- and It's the other easier. Thing, it's easier to do it that way. The other thing you can do with the frame is, is you can cut out all the old wax and just leave like a fringe, a half inch, a three quarter inch or whatever, and put it back in the hive and they'll draw a nice comb in the springtime as long as you put it between two already drawn frames. Yeah, I guess you could do that, but then you're trying to get the old comb out of the out of the colony so that you would put it back, you're putting it back in then, right? No, I'm cutting it all out except for a little a little fringe of wax. So like a little, a little bit of a little bit of pesticides, all right, that you're saying. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> yeah. So Ralph comes up with these ideas. I, I don't know where he gets them, but he, he comes up with them. I'm, most of them are really good. You know, but they don't have a string of them where they're like really like like entertaining. I don't think you should do that, Ralph. I can, you don't mind if I disagree with that little strip thing. That's there. okay. The only thing is, it, it, it'll probably be, be drone. So if you're looking to make drone frames, it's a good way of doing it. Okay, so you're but, making drone frames. Okay, Bill, I think that um, it's really useful in order to like keep fresh comb either like. This year I got a really fabulous swarm and I used it specifically to draw fresh. Oh, they love and, um, I mean, I maybe would even consider getting a package just for the purpose of, or, or even when I do divisions in the spring, just shaking, you know, getting a new queen and putting like three or four pounds in a box just with like their purpose in my yard is just to make new comb for me. That's, that's a wonderful idea. So, so the, um, the formula of becoming a successful beekeeper is to find people in your club that are on calls like this that get their hives to survive over the winter time. And they have apiaries, they end up with apiaries with too many bees in them that they don't want. And, and then you seek them out for advice about what they do. Lauren's one of those people. So, I mean, you should you know contact her and let her know um, if you have a question about how she keeps her bees alive, because year after year she does. This year she has um, a um, wonderful yard with too many bees in it, but um, that's another way swarms that you catch early in the spring. Of course, there's a few that all occur now, but, they're, but they won't do the same thing for you. But ones that you catch early in the spring are just dying to build comb. And they will build you the most beautiful comb you you can imagine, and you should do that if you catch one. All right. So, um, uh, so Ralph, Ralph, you have a question about honey. Should I yeah. read that, or do you want me to read? You want to read it? Uh, does it make sense? In other words, when your honey sits around for like a year, you yeah, get two <laughs> two different strata in the jar. The bottom of the jar is thick. And the top of the jar is thinner. Okay. So just, I just wonder what those two substances are, and can I think you told me once you cannot recombine them. So I think I think what you have, what you were describing is the separation of glucose and fructose, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Well, the, what happens is the glucose <clears throat> in that jar is going down to the bottom. Glucose is never doesn't want to. To make it simple, there's a lot of science behind this, but I'm just going to say, simplify it. Glucose does not want to say stay liquid in honey, in no way. It wants to precipitate out into a crystal, right? So, mm -hmm. and it's because the um, the bees have super cooled it. Now that's a, a technical term, but um, that's what's happened. Honey is a super cooled liquid, and it doesn't want to stay stable. So when you take it out of the colony. 
you take it out of a 95 degree environment or whatever it's in there, it will start to crystallize. The sucrose will um, <clears throat> precipitate out. The glucose will precipitate out and the fructose st will stay liquid forever. And that's when you see those that beautiful separation. Now, um, sunflower honey, if you ever saw that, you would just go crazy because what ends up happening with uh, that honey, sunflower honey, is it, it, it converts into two different levels of liquid honey. One is a beautiful, a rich brown. The other one is beautiful golden yellow. You're not talking about that. Now you can heat no. jar and it'll go back liquid. And those two will combine again. Yeah, I've done that in the sun, and then they just seem to separate out real quickly. Well, yeah, you got to heat it up pretty good to get it to melt. Yeah, right. but, but yeah, once it's if you if you're just um, uh, if you're just like fooling around um, and trying to get it to do in the sun, like you know, like like sun, like making sun tea on your on your um, like on your windowsill, Ralph. Well. And a hot sunny day when it's 90, that honey is liquefied just about five, six hours. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's like putting it into hot tea. And then it's you can shake it up and reconstitute it or emulsify it. But then it seems to really quickly yeah, yeah. Go, go back to that state. Especially if, a, especially if it's a high glucose honey. All right, so if I know when to gather water versus nectar, well, they're separate, they're separate foragers. All right, so there's water collect. There's every bee in the colony has the genetic is the genetics to become either a forager or a water collector. They learn their job. How they learn it, even Tom Seeley couldn't answer that question at EAS. So uh, what will happen is, um, for some reason or another, um, the colony will be uh, the foragers will be. Um, Receiver bees will go along to the bees that are coming in the colony. If the colony needs water, there's receiver waters and neck. There's re there's water receivers and there's nectar receivers, and those bees will go along and test the foragers that are coming back. And when they find if they want water, but they find nectar, they pass and move to the next bee. It's incredible. Um, wow. Biological adaptation. The colony. Wow sends water foragers out or water foragers go out on their own when they sense that the colony is dry or overheated. It's mostly overheated, right? So when they're overheated, then they start to forage for water and they're specialized. So, so right? it's not a communication between the house bees and the foragers. It's the fact no. that the foragers are specialized and they're sensing what's the environment of the hive and what's needed. Absolutely. Wow. They're absolutely um, uh, sensing it. And then, but I think the most interesting part about that, first of all, your colony is mostly always collecting water. Not a, not a lot, but almost always. Now, during that 90 degree stretch we had, you had you had plenty of bees out there all the time collecting water for your colony to cool it. You know, they use swamp cooling techniques. You know, like, I don't know if you've ever seen a swamp cooler down in Florida or something where, you know, they you mist water into a fan and then they, they blow it all over the uh, patrons that are eating outside and it's, you know, it cools you off. Same thing with with a bee colony. They have a fan, droplets of water that are hanging on cell lids and on other surfaces, and they they have a, they basically evaporate that uh, water and um, and then it cools the colony. All right. So are there also propolis collectors? Yeah, there's just yeah, the propolis collectors are also specialized. All right. So you can you get nectar collectors, water collectors. And propolis collectors, the and pollen collectors, they're all oh, four of them are 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 specialized, and they and that's what they do. They collect pollen, and they and some bees will collect pollen and nectar, you know. But um, mm -hmm. you know, but that's a, e beta cosamine is a is the um, is the uh, 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 volatile organic compound that that brood gives off to signal. Uh, pollen collectors that they need to go to work, All right? So there's a certain brood pheromone that comes off of the brood that makes it. So um, yeah, the, the interesting part about propolis collectors is that they can't get the propolis off their corbicula, their right. pollen basket, All right? So it's there's videos out there you can look at them, and um, they're rare, but if you ever and if you ever see that, film it uh, because it would be wonderful to see. 
And you'll love seeing it because to get that propolis, which is really sticky stuff, we all know that as beekeepers, off <laughs> of the hind yeah. leg of a bee, it requires another bee to pull it off. Or a hive tool. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they don't have hive, tool, hive tools. Um, I got a hive a couple of weeks ago and I opened it up just to see what's going on in there. And only one of my uh, frames has honey on it. Is it too late for them to get going here for the winter? I bought an established hive. What do you mean one frame has honey? Oh, one wow. frame has honey. All the other ones have like uh, the queen cells and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right. Yeah, you'd have to show me some pictures. I have no idea from your explanation what's going on. Because, I mean, if you're saying queen cells, to me, that means something different. Sounds like he has a lack of storage during the drought. Uh, drought. Lack so of storage. So, Chris... Chris, so the, the first definition we need, do you actually mean queen cells? I think so. They're like big, the big long cells that stick up. Yeah, well, that colony is doing something else that I can't really, if it's got a lot of queen cells in it, maybe it already swarmed. You're just seeing cells. Are the ends open on the cells? Um, Some of them. Yeah, okay. So that colony swarmed. What you're seeing is... um you know, the, the, the aftermath of swarms, they leave the swarm cells in there for a while. They'll eventually break them down, use the wax someplace else, but for the, right after the swarm and for, for weeks after the swarm, if the colony's busy doing other things, you know, they'll leave those swarm cells up and working and, uh, or, or alive, I'm not alive, formed and they won't, um, they won't tear them down till much later. In the fall, they'll tear them all down. But you're probably looking at a colony that's swarmed and it hasn't made a lot of resources. So I don't know. You have two boxes or one? No, there, there's three. Like, what are they, two deeps and a medium? Yeah. I, I am honestly not 100% sure. Yes. Okay. So, what, yeah, we're going to have to get, yeah, you have to get a little familiar with the terminology. And, you know, if there's no, you're talking about no honey in that top box. Um, no, there's no honey. I, I the second box has one frame of honey, which is very weird from my what I've looked up. Yeah, I don't know. I can't say that um, that um, that the colony's in real trouble. They got a month or two. Yeah, where they can. But are you feeding? You need to be feeding those bees. Yeah, yeah you can. You know, like I said, I got it. I got it two weeks ago. And I started giving them uh, sugar water the second that I got it. Oh. But uh, I was expecting that where they were previously, like 45 minutes away from me, they would have built up some some honey by now. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, so, yeah. So I think Lauren's correct. You got to keep feeding those bees, Chris, and see what happens. But they got a lot of time. Okay, good. Thank you. You know, they, they might be living on what we refer, to, we refer to as living on the edge. You know, they're bringing in enough to stay alive. They got a big population of bees. Very big. Yeah. Okay. Now, so the Lauren is correct again. So you, you also need to figure out the queen situation if you have all those either supersedure or emergency cells. Do you see eggs? Um. Yes. The the I was shown eggs before I grabbed it. But that was two weeks ago. Yeah, and now right. and now you have emergency cells. No, I think I think he's I think that colony swarmed, and it re, it requeened itself because he's saying that he had he sees eggs now. So if he did, and if he sees swarm cells and eggs, then it's likely that it it was successful in being able to requeen itself. They're very like they're not crazy. They're very you know happy as you would say. Yeah, happy. Chris, do you know the difference between drone cells and queen cells? No, he's I not, do not. He's not talking about drone cells. He's, he he described them as long. And but he doesn't know the difference between the two. There we go. She showed us the drone cells. Well, we, I know the difference between the bees, but not the cells. Okay. All right. So um send me some photographs. All right, I will. But I think you should continue to feed them as Lauren suggested. And if you saw eggs, uh, that means you have a queen. It means it's a queen right colony. Unless there's multiple eggs in the cells. Are there more than one eggs in those cells? You saw? No. All right. Cool. All right. But you've seen pictures, pictures recently, not two weeks ago? 
Um, exactly. It, or when you got it two weeks ago. I, I haven't opened it up because I've kind of been letting them get their uh, get their wheels wet. Oh. Yeah. So you got some interesting terms. Um, for, <laughs> you know, we don't we don't use any of them, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, let's, let's, right, we're going to move, move on because we this oh, Bill, you know, we, okay. yeah you, you got so one one thing for B talks is we'll we'll we will um, uh, entertain any question that comes up um, but if um, but it behooves you to get a mentor at this point Chris and and uh, you're in CBA of course yeah you're a member oh yeah apply for a mentor and and see if they can help you because you really do need to have somebody go in there with you and answer all the questions that Lauren and others are asking you, you know, and showing you each one and then make an assessment of the hive with you so that you, they can figure out what's going on for you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so you talked about uh, toxin accumulation. In yes. The wax. I've, I've really found it easy to work with the plastic foundation I have, but do I have to be concerned if over time the plastic will accumulate the toxins also? Uh, no, you don't have to worry about the, you mean because you're going to scrape them off and put them back in there? Um, yeah, but extracting the honey or whatever I do, I could, like you said, scrape off the very dark wax and put it back in. Is that all right to do in the long term? You, yes, you can do that with plastic foundation. Well, the plastic is not lipophilic. Right. Okay. So, uh, plastic is sort of food grade plastic, especially. Right. And that's what they make those frames out of. So, yeah, you can do that. You're going to leave a little wax on that surface, but you can do that. That's a practice lots of people do. Okay. Thank you. Yep. My first question is when should I treat for mites? And the second question is should I leave one honey super on for winter or remove late fall. Thank you. Okay. This is um, an ex a great example of um, the kinds of questions that you have to actually uh, observe to answer. So you're excited. You got honey. Uh, when should you treat for mites? This is a great time to treat with um, something like Formic Pro or Mite Away Quick Strips Oxalic acid won't work very well here, but if you're determined to treat, um, you, there's a bunch of thymol products that you can't use with supers, but since you have supers on, um, you can use MitoWay Quick, you can use MitoWay Quick Strips or Formic Pro, which is both are a formic acid formulation, and both of those will control your mites at this time of the year. So your second question is, should you leave a honey super on for winter? Well, you should be able to pack enough honey in that second deep for okay. wintering over. Make sure that whatever you do, you leave enough honey. Yep. For them to get through the winter. And that should be something that you either you'll have to feed, or if we don't have a, if our fall flow doesn't materialize, you're going to have to feed um, in the fall. Um, I suspect that it will this year, but maybe not. Hi. Um, so, um, I was told that groups sometimes place like bulk equipment orders um, in order to get like a discount. And I was wondering if you guys do that and if you do when, like what time of the year? No, we don't do that. Um, uh, because you have to like order lots and lots of stuff. What kind of equipment are you looking for? Just like the high bodies and the, the supers, you know, mediums, deeps, just. Just yeah. ever. Yeah, no, we don't. Um, and maybe frames too. Yeah. Or. Yeah, the only discount you get from the suppliers that I know of, and I mean, if you were going to order 500 boxes, you might get a discount. And I but, you do get a discount. But, um, but it's not enough for us to put together an order. Um, you know, Man Lake and <laughs> Better Be and all of them will give you, Better Be especially will give you, um, you know, discounts or you won't have to pay any shipping on them so you know and if you're only going to buy a couple of boxes um you know you're, you're in pretty good shape there you know, um, just, uh, i'm sorry we don't do that uh so a uh, follow-up there's the basic three would be like better be man like didon like yeah. um do you have any recommendations of which ones are better or they're all exactly the same or no they're, they're not all they're not exactly the same so um, what ends up happening is there are minor differences in them, Jamie. So there's little, 
little uh, ways that they see on the frame rests that are different. So if I were you, and if I could start all over, I would have one manufacturer's box and one manufacturer's frame. And I would stay with that line, especially if you're only gonna have two or three colonies, I suggest you don't mix and match between Dayton boxes and, and, um, and Better Bee and, and Man Lake because there are slight differences in, in the frame lengths and frame rests. And it's um, better to stay with one manufacturer. You get good B space that way. You know, Bill, between... I would really agree with that. And I would also mention um, that if you're going to buy a nuke at any point, definitely get those from Better Bee and not from Man Lake. Man Lake's nukes are weirdly large. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, and all right. So as you go down, all right, when you leave the Langstroth deep box, right, those are pretty much all 16 and a quarter by 19 and an eighth uh, on the outside dimensions. But when you go down to nukes, uh, as Lauren's suggesting, they get really strange. You know, you can get a four frame, a five frame, a six frame, and you can get a, a nuke double nukes that fit on one bottom board. So, I mean, yeah, there's all different size nuke boxes out there. So you got to be careful if you're starting to do that with nukes. Yeah, so at mediums, you know, the bigger boxes, the eight frames and the 10 frame boxes, pretty much standard sizes, outside diameter sizes. Um, do any of you make your own boxes? And if you do, is, is it cost effective or no. is absolutely not cost effective to make your own box you might you have to put and the people that i've seen make their own box have no idea what they're doing on, at the box end the joint end you have to make a box joint there it's not as it's not actually a dovetail it's a box joint you need special equipment to do that if you don't make that box joint right your, your box will fall apart lots of people that have some woodworking experience think they can do that and they end up making a junky box so um, yeah, so buy the boxes, okay. buy them unpainted, paint them yourself, glue them together with tight bond three on the, on the edges, make sure they're square and flat before you let put clamps on them or whatever you're gonna do. And then what I suggest you do is drill each place where you would normally put a nail and put in a deck screw in there, uh, a ceramic coated deck screw so that, that that box will last forever. Glued and screwed, it will never come apart. Okay, hey, thank you. Hey, Bill. Yes. I have a suggestion for people that have questions like this is I'll buy, you know, like five boxes from Man Lake. But yeah. it, and and now, you know, if you get to they they bumped it up. If you spend $150, it's free shipping. Yes. <clears throat> so one month you buy boxes, the next month you buy a hundred frames, you know, and each month you incrementally do this. You're not you're not putting out a ton of money in one shot. I see. But but you accumulate your supplies that way. And I it, I did this myself. It seemed to work pretty good. It it you know didn't make it so painful to go out and spend a thousand dollars, which you could easily accumulate. But buying in quantities, you know, five boxes, a hundred frames you know, a hundred sheets of foundation, that's where you're going to save a little bit. You're going to save a dollar or so in each one of these things. But if you're going out and buying one box and things like that, you're getting killed in the price. Yeah. Good suggestion, Kurt. That's so, great. Yeah. I also like to make a suggestion of you can go to your local suppliers around Connecticut and you can sit there and talk to them and decide what kind of boxes and, and, uh, They'll answer a bunch of questions for you. Sure, and like um, you mean like up. like uh, like B Commerce. Yeah, that's right. B Commerce. You have uh, yeah. Stone Hall. You have A and Z Apiaries. You, there's a whole bunch of them in the state that you can go to. And well, and, you can also you can also come to the B Yard or or you know and look at boxes that you want and um, and get an explanation for the like I have a bunch of different boxes. Not everybody makes their frame rest the same way. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that's a little bit different. And the um, the uh, the top top bars, some of them are tapered, some of them, and the shoulders are different widths and stuff like that. So I agree, you know, you can go around and look and get a good suggestion. Greek audience participation tonight. Love it. <clears throat> All right, so, so 
let's see. So uh, Toth has a question. And if you show, if you have a black comb, like, yeah, so wax moth and black comb don't have anything to do with each other, right? Wax moth will come into your colony. This time of year, of course, there's going to be wax moth trying to get into your colony. If your colony is good and strong, they won't make it in. If it's not, if it's weak in any way, and the guard bees can't deal with the wax moth uh, infestation, then you'll have wax moth that will larvate in your colony and it'll, they'll just be a mess. So good, strong colonies, wax moth, no problem. If you have a screen board this time of year, pollen will fall off of um, the bee's hind legs before they pack it sometimes or in the process of packing it, trying to kick it into a cell, they lose it. And you'll get quite a bit of wax, um, excuse me, pollen that'll fall through the screen and will be under the colony. If you have a hard surface under the colony, like you have it on a mat or a block of wood or something or something like that, um, where the pollen can collect, you'll get wax moth down there also. And they're outside the colony at that point, doesn't really matter much, but um, you will get wax moth inside covers and different places that wax moth will accumulate. Your problem is not wax moth. Usually if your colonies are really strong here in Connecticut, we don't have a problem with them. If they die and you leave the comb in there, um, yeah, that will be a problem. If you store comb unprotected from moths, you're gonna what wax moth will get in there eventually and just ruin all your comb. So yeah, so it doesn't have anything to do with the blackness of it. They'll go after brand new comb. <laughs> wax moth don't. Uh, oh, can you use it to start your smoker? What's that? What was you what were you asking there, Carol? About what? No, somebody was talking about what to do with um old comb and i just yeah. couldn't no i don't see no i wouldn't suggest you use it to start your smoker it will burn yeah. but um you know um i don't know I, if it didn't i don't know I, I wouldn't do that i mean if there's a bunch of toxins in the comb then you're if you light it on fire you're releasing those out so you know you'd be breathing them you know i don't know i, I wouldn't do it okay all right so i mean that's just me. You can do that. You know, it will work. You have honey that's two or three years old that is still liquid and honey that I harvested last year is totally crystallized. Is it a function of moisture? No, it's not moisture. Crystallization has nothing to do with moisture. All right, crystallization has to do with the content of glucose to fructose in your honey. A small imbalance one way or another and um, where, the, where the glucose is higher than the fructose content, uh, you will get crystallization occurring right away. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's the difference. That one that stayed liquid for you had a higher fructose content. And the one that crystallized, given that you didn't change anything in your processing, you either filtered it the same way, um, you didn't heat it, you didn't do anything like that, um, you know, to the first batch that's that remained liquid. Um, it's just a matter of plant varieties that they picked up that year. And um, and it became a more a higher glucose honey. I really wanted to get bees this year, so like in the spring, I can start off running. And um, I obviously, the instructor for my Cornell course said that it's too late to get a package, but I could get a nuke, or I could catch a swarm. Yeah, I think both of those possibilities are be very difficult right now. You can get a nuke from somebody, I guess. You know, at this point, somebody has a nuke for sale, you could get it. But you're at the end, you're in August now. So right. our cutoff date for nukes be able to build to survival is about the second week in July. So, you know, so it would be very difficult for you to get it up to speed, but you could overwinter it as a nuke. And um, you just have to make sure it has plenty of food and you'd have to try to, you, that would be a like tough one for a first year beekeeper. Like, like bring it in the house? No, no, no. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Be, you, you know, so you can get your, um, so you can do some things um, as a beekeeper that will um, really alienate from, alienate you from your family. That's one of them. You know, if you bring bees into your house, the rest of your family will get stung and stuff like that. They won't like it. But I love the idea. I've done it um, and it doesn't work really well. So, uh, you know, you can't do that, but you leave them outside and yeah, you'd have to get them over, but you would need help doing that. You would need help figuring out, you know, and you, you have to bring them, you'd have to get them to 
be insulated in some way to get them through the winter, but I winter nucleus colonies successfully every year. Um, would it be better to get a swarm because they're less likely to have mites? Like, I don't like, I, I really want bees now, but I also feel like the responsible thing to do is to wait till spring and get a package because they're less likely to have, or you could treat the adults for mites and you're not getting like brood frames that have mites in them. Correct. Um, That's correct. So you're better off waiting till spring. I have to tell you, you're not going to find a swarm now. I mean, you'd be very unlikely for you to find a swarm at this point. You know, um, they do occur, but how would you find one? And, you know, like it would be it would be almost impossible for you to find a swarm at this point. So those are that's a spring thing, swarm. Um geo the process reward network that stimulates a special state. Well it, it's a learned behavior. So I it could be, you know, we don't know, but we do know that they specialize and they stay specialized. So it's really, really one of those things. And you know, Geo is a deep thinker, I can tell. And um, and you might be right. So uh, look up Tom Seeley and ask him this, ask him those questions. He will answer you. I have two nukes made. I don't know what that means. Late spring. Oh, made in late spring. Okay, they are booming, and I moved them this week to a temp frame box. Can I start feeding them now? Is using a frame feeder safer for Robbie? Well, any kind of a feeder that's protected from other bees is um, okay to use at this point, including a division board feeder, which is what you're referring to as a frame feeder. So that's commonly encouraged as a division board feeder. And that you can use inside a colony. You can put it, that's a difficult thing to get out of the colony. So, I mean, if you're going to continue to feed them, I would use a top feeder at this point. If you can, you can even use a jar you know, uh, or a couple of jars, as long as you elevate them, poke holes in the lids, and you can put a couple of, uh, you know, quarts of syrup in there at a time, let the bees take it down and keep putting it in. Now, um, yeah, you, if they're booming and you put them in colonies now, you can, you can try to build them up and you're going to, you're going to overwinter those in one deep. That's what you're going to end up doing. Don't use a Boardman feeder, no matter what you do. That will encourage robbing. Don't spill anything in the yard while you're in this process, like spilling a lot of syrup or anything like that, because that will also encourage robbing. So just be cautious to be clean and neat when you're feeding the bees, and you should be okay. So explain what you're what you're trying to say there. Well, uh, you're in Europe <clears throat> a while ago. They they were using CO two to uh, euthanize uh, bees when they were checking for varroa. And what yes. happens is it doesn't kill the bees, uh, actually, but it releases the varroa. So I recently saw uh, one of the companies in the US is, and it may be Vito, Vita Pharma, uh, who makes the easy uh, check uh, container. Yes. Uh, now sells a an injector, but I don't know how it works. Uh, if you spray it into the container and screw the lid on, or is it a new lid that you stick the injector in? But you use that instead of alcohol in order to knock the mites off uh, your bees, and then the bees supposedly survive. So. That, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, no, I mean, I know it's, I know that there's, I know that it's possible to do it that way. I don't know the procedure, but I will look into it because, um, but it, it's it's not practical for us to do that, by the way. Um, well, they're, they're selling the product, so I don't know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure. I don't even know if it's legal. I think it is legal. Because you're not using it as a miticide, you're using it as yeah. a check. So it would right. be fine. Uh, Tony, go on the internet, get a picture of that thing, and 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 put it up for us. Okay? Can you do that? Uh, do yeah, I'm on my it? phone, so I'm kind of limited to what I can do. All right. So if somebody wants to do that, the CO2 injector for Varroa EasyCheck, I don't know if it's Varroa EasyCheck that's doing that, 
so we can see a little bit about what's going on there. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think I don't see the need for it. I mean, if you don't want to kill bees, I understand the the urge not to want to kill um, 300 bees in your colony, but you know, I want to just remind you that you'll get your blood tested, um, and you will you will kill hundreds of millions of of cells. Of course, your body makes 100 million cells um, a second to replace them, but um, you you are it's the same with bees. A little bit of uh, sacrifice for the diagnostic of the saving the whole colony is is uh, kind of a good thing. And at this point in the season, let's see, we're in August. There's about eight or nine hundred bees that die normally every day in your colony. Um, earlier than this in the season, there were a thousand. So um, you know, so the natural attrition of bees is always going to be much higher than of a road check would be. And it will not hurt the colony to lose 300 bees, assuming that you have more than 300 bees in the colony. <laughs> you know, so Paul Tony. Bill, yes. I have a setup I got from the bike shop I want to try. What I is... want to try and save the varroa mites and not get them contaminated with alcohol or powdered sugar. So you want to keep them alive? Yeah. For well, that, that there's a market. You, you realize there's a big market for live varroa, for researchers want them. Well, and, that's what I was kind of thinking. I got ideas. Ah, uh, okay. So, um, yeah. So CO two just for for people that don't know, CO two acts differently on insects than it does on humans. All right. If you breathe a lot of CO two in an environment, um, you are going to get um, hypoxia and then die. So, but that's not what happens to bees. Bees will go into an ultra low metabolic rate when they are exposed to high concentrations of CO2 and it doesn't kill them. Um, uh, the fact that the mites detach is interesting to me. I'm not sure if, um, by the way, this was not a subject at all in EAS. But I'll ask around. I'll see uh, Vita Pharma, and and I'll I'll go over to the EasyCheck booth, and I'll and I'll if there's CO2 attachments there, um, I'll get the explanation. I'll pick one up, and then I'll post something. Would you feed during a dearth? To, to well, this time of year, I would probably feed a tiny bit heavier syrup. So we have these sort of um, prescriptive ways we talk about feed: light syrup, heavy syrup, and two to one, and one to one. But you can do almost anything with bees in terms in between those two uh, measurements by weight. So in other words, when we talk to, about one to one, we're talking about 10 pounds of sugar, 10 pounds of water. Uh, two to one, we're talking about <clears throat> 20 pounds of sugar and 10 pounds of water makes a heavier syrup. So, but you can make one and a half to one. And this year, I would start. I would tend to make a heavier syrup if I was feeding for the dirt. Right? Because Bill, the reason I asked the question, I just was looking at hives today, and I saw that not one of them was uh, had very little nectar in it. So, um, but I was thinking about a uh, one-to-one -one tends to be a stimulative feeding for brood uh, production. Yes. And a ten-to-one, a two-to-one tends to be a easier to store because there's less moisture to evaporate. That's what part of what part of what the question was. Yeah, I I, no, I get about. that. I get that. But I, I don't think you're going to reverse the biology at this point, Ralph, you know, because the queens are naturally stopping, you know, curtailing laying, whether or not you can turn it around with a one to one thinking that you're stimulating. I mean, if you put a ton of one to one on there and a bunch of pollen patties and you fake the bees into thinking it's springtime, maybe you can get them to uh, brood up a little bit more. But that wouldn't be the thing I would do. That's why I'm saying at this point in the year, I put a thicker syrup on, even even two mm -hmm. to one wanted. Yeah. Hey, Bill. Good. Thanks. Yes. Bill, quick question based on you, you and Ralph's, your, your conversation just then. So yeah. is, is, I guess, is anyone experiencing a dearth? Because I mean, I'm seeing a ton of pollen, a ton of honey being made in my, in my colonies. Yeah, there's a lot in in bloom right now between the loose strife and again not that circular conversation, but with everything that were is in bloom in my area, which is what most of the people, including you, had said in the call earlier. Are, is there a dearth? Well, so yeah. some people, all beekeeping will, is local. Some yeah, people true. will experience a dearth 
here at this, at this point, you know, and it depends on, you know, where you are in the state. We have all kinds of little interesting microclimates around. And, you know, since you're not experiencing a dearth, dearth this time of year, it's wonderful. I mean, that's great. I mean, I wish everybody was in your situation, but it's probably there are some people that are struggling. I am also seeing tons of pollen coming in and they have, when I was in a dearth, which was in the beginning of um, July, um, they ate back some of the honey they'd stored in their, in, their, in their supers. And I noticed just recently that they're putting nectar in there. So they're going to end up, you know, filling that second super up again. So I'm, I'm, I'm in your situation, but you can be anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, full transparency, I'm, I'm feeding right now just to have them try and build more foundation out, uh, you know, before the, the fall and winter come. That's, that's the only way I'm feeding, or especially for a couple of nukes that I had. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, you know, and then you can feed them now if you if you want to. I'm not. I don't feed until I see what uh, Goldenrod and, and Knotweed are doing. If it's, they're having a bad year, I'll feed out stuff. If they don't, my boxes, you know, they just are heavy. They they're like lead. They got um, a bunch of uh, honey in the top box, and they have big populations of bees, and they have um, honey in the super. So. All right, so um, smoker material, uh, uh, twine, yeah, and I read that 100% cotton is also good to burn. Adding 100% cotton balls to sisal, which is um, a, a twine, um, be okay to make good smoke. Cotton balls, no, the cotton that they're talking about is fabric. And they sell that actually, uh, Teresa, as a, um, as a actual smoke, uh, smoker fuel. Right, so I got a free sample of it um, at EAS and I put it in my smoker last time I lit it and it seemed like it worked fine. It um, seemed great to me that sample that came from did, EAS. Did I you, mean, I would, yeah, I would never spend money. On, I would never no. pay for fuel, like not in a million years, but I really liked that sample. Yeah, that sample was kind of cool. I, I, um, I used that sample for something else too. So I found it really useful I keep alcohol in my yards so I can clean things off um, and uh, or use it for rolls, washes, I should say. And one of those little cotton things they gave us, if you soak with alcohol, you can clean your hive tool off real nice. So um, prior to that, I was, I was just scraping it down, but I thought they were cool. Little tiny patch comes out really quick. So, oh, did I just? Oh, so I should just cut up cotton t-shirts then. Go yeah, to no, Goodwill. You, no, what you should what you should do is yeah, you can cut up cotton t-shirts if you want no. and use it for smoke or fuel. But you can go around and pick up pine needles for nothing. You know, and yeah, great smoke or fuel. I don't have a pine tree. <laughs> no, no, you don't. You don't need a pine tree. You got to go find some in your neighborhood. Yeah, it's true. I can. And you know what happens with pine trees that overhang the street a little bit? You get needles in the gutter. And if you've had a long stretch of, they're perfect. And I have places that I've identified that I can go rake. I've never had anybody say anything to me about raking the street. You know, so um, um, they, and they've never said anything to me. And, and I have people that say, hey, you know, come in here and rake as many needles as you want. And then some people start, they started, you know, putting needles in bags for me. And um, and that got out of hand. I had so many pine needles, I could have, I threw them on my blueberry bushes, you know? So um, yeah, but you can find, you can go and find, as Lauren says, you'll never pay for smoker fuel, either will I, find pine somewhere or use some other thing that you can find readily. But you can, okay. if you have a bunch of old t-shirts, you can cut them up and use them. You know, uh, cotton smells a little funny when it um, when it burns. You have to make sure you get white smoke out of it. If you don't get white smoke out of it, stop using it. You know, you got to have, you can't get that black smoke out. You have to get cool okay. smoke. Right. Yeah, it's, okay. uh, clothing might have chemicals in it, like fire yeah, yeah. retardants and stuff. Yeah, so. fire retardants, yes, for sure. Clothing don't touch, especially kids' clothes, because they definitely got fire retardant in it. Yeah, it would have to be you know, old t-shirts from Gap. 
like from 1970 or something that you're wearing. <laughs> so I don't know what that is. That's just a that's just a gut, a little pin that you spray into your easy check. Yeah, that's a, a basketball pin. All right. So, but the bees are in the wrong place. Right. They, I guess they, yeah, put, why are the bees below the basket? Yeah. The, so this is an easy check for those of that you don't know. It's, this is the device we use with alcohol to what we, what they call wash bees. So in, in this case, um, <clears throat> some, I don't know where this picture came from, but there's CO2 in that cartridge there. Um, and uh, in this case, they've put their bee sample below the basket. Normally the bees would be in that white portion. That white portion comes out and you can put a half a cup of bees in there. And then the bottom part where you see bees now would be filled with alcohol. And as soon as you put the bees in there, they die um, with the alcohol. And then you just swish the whole deal around and, um, and you, you, your row fall off and you can read them from the alcohol mixture in the bottom. But right at this point, I don't know what this thing is doing. But yeah, I guess if you sprayed a bunch of, uh... so what I would do is I would knock the bees out with the CO2 and then I'll put them in the alcohol wash because it would be like, you know, a nice transition for them. They're not going right into the alcohol. Hey, Bill, in the, in the video, he, he flips it. So the mites are on the yellow cup, but the bees are still stuck in there. Oh, cool. All right, so then you would give them their dose. What well, I don't know, whatever dose you would give them. I guess if you put enough CO two in there, you can kill a bee. But yes, you can. Yeah. Um, so you got to figure out your dosage. Maybe it's one or two squirts. You get it. You get the right amount in there, and then I see because the bees are below the basket. Then if you turn the basket upside down, the mites will fall into the yellow cup. All right. Wow, it's cool. That's cool. You know, where do you get that gun? Oh, that's that's a simple bicycle uh, pump. I have I have a couple of those, and you just use the basketball um, or football, you know, valve. I think, and you put CO two in them. Yeah, the CO two goes right in that black um, cartridge, and you screw no, no, it no. Out. I'm saying you you put CO two in your bike your bike wheels and your basketballs or whatever else you use. Yes. Using. Well, All yes. Right. Okay. All so right. when you're on the road, it it could pack a lot of uh, air in in there fill up a, a tire at least once anyway <laughs> so you get them at bike shops then oh yeah yes yeah i got i i got this picture off of man lake and uh it sells for 25 bucks what and their instructions say to spray co2 into the container for about six seconds screw Whoa. the cap on shake it around and turn it upside down and you can put, uh, you can drop the bees back in the hive and they'll revive. Okay. So what we'll do, I'll get one of these bike pumps. I'll get, I'll get down the bike shop. I'm not going to get anything from me. And like, I'll get this thing and uh, we'll try it on the 19th. We'll see how it works. Pretty simple. Six seconds. The CO2 is heavier than air. We all know that. So it won't come back out once you're spraying it in. It'll lay down on the bottom of that cup. So um, yeah, we'll try it six seconds. We just have to remember one thing, six seconds and we can do it. Hey, Bill, you Very just cool. answered your question. Yeah. Why are the bees underneath the basket? Cause CO2 is heavier. Yeah, heavy, CO2 is heavier than air. So mm -hmm. that way you shock them for six seconds, then you flip it over. Yes. All right, I'll try it. I'll try it before so, the night. So 19th. the CO2 kills the mites, but not the bees and then you bang them off, is that the? So no, I, I, what, what no, does it, it does not. It does not it kill the mites. It, it, yeah, no, it, it knocks them out, but it does not kill them. Yeah, and these would it, be it right. knocks them out, and they let go of the bees, and then they end up in the cup. Yes. Yeah, they end up in the they up in, end up in the yellow part of the cup. That's when you may want to break out your alcohol. <laughs> um. So it's the, I understand the process now. So we know we've learned a little something together here on, um, on B Talks tonight, which is the absolute way to do it.
somebody brings up an idea, we all go out and figure it out how it works. And this is perfect. I will go get one of those things. I'm excited about this. I'll try it um, on a colony way before the 19th. And then I'll try it again on, on the 19th. Six seconds seems like a lot of show too. That's enough to blow up a whole basketball, I would think. But, um, you know, so, but it'll lay down in the bottom of that cup. And then uh, now this will only, I'm certain it will not detach a mite that is feeding on a bee, which is what occurs with an alcohol wash. You can kill mites, that, but these will be mites that are questing or dispersing, we call it. Now, you know, we're, hey, Bill. Uh, they're, on the, they're on the surface of the mite, not biting it. Yes. Hey, Bill. I've been waiting very patiently, Bill. I Who's never that? got to my question. It's Carol. Oh, Carol, I thought I got your question. No, nope, I think it's all right. Um, so hold, hold your thought and then let's ask, let's Carol ask, ask her question. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just one, I just want to make a comment about the CO2. And I'm sorry I can't quote who the researcher was, but I was listening to this researcher and she made the comment that CO2 does have an effect on the bees and it does have an effect on their longevity in terms of their life. And um, as does the uh, sugar method. And she was very pro just using the alcohol. So, I mean, I wasn't, after yeah. hearing her and I had read about the CO2 method and everything else, I thought this is not, it's not worth it. Anyway, so that's just my thought. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you who it was. But my question was, is I want to use Formic Pro. And my question was, is it too late? to use it, because I understand the temperature should be between 60 and 80 degrees. 85. 85, okay. All right, so, so, but it's not so too it's late 90. to use it now, is it? No, it's not too late to use it. Okay, it's a perfect, it's a and then my other question is, what is your preferred method? Because I used the two strip method one dose last year and I had um, a, the cemetery on my back porch. Somehow my queen survived, I guess, but I don't know if I should use the two strip method again or just use the one strip, wait 10 days, put the other strip in. What do, what do you suggest? I, you know, so I go by colony strength when I make that decision. If it's a really strong colony, I put two strips on. If it's a smaller colony, I'll put one and then 10 days later, put another one on. Okay, it's, and it's I, a matter of dosage, so I go by the strength of the colony. Big, strong, um, healthy, um, uh, you know, two frame uh, colony. I'll put two strips on. I have a question. That, uh, Did that answer uh, your question? I, I did. I had one more question, which is uh, this is in re relation to this on the temperature. Yeah. Um, sure. Someone spoke that as long as the it's within the range for the first three days, it doesn't matter if it goes higher. Yes, and 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 by the way, and uh, that was verified by the people from NOD that I discussed this with about you know five or six days ago. Okay, they Thank said you something for else. They said there's they said something else to me, which I won't, which I will never admit that I repeated to you. But they also say that they're very conservative in their 85 degree top limit. So you need for what it's worth. So they're being very conservative. And they I, I believe that. All right. And they've said that, you know, you know, 90 degrees is probably no damage at all. But you know, I would I would suggest that you stay within the limits of the label. It's not illegal to use it at higher temperatures. That's not that's not what I'm saying, but um, but it might do some damage. So be careful. And I understand that you're not supposed to feed them for at least three days before you use it. Yeah, that's a dumb thing. So the, the, they, the only reason that they say don't feed them is because they didn't test that formulaic uh, formic acid with when they were feeding. So mm -hmm. they don't know okay. if it'll do anything. To and them. I have a five frame uh, nuke. I don't know if I should try to treat it with this or not. No. Uh, that's, so if a five frame nuke, I used to double D, double. A what? I have, it's, you know, double. It's five frames on top of five frames. So it's, it's a single colony. Yes. Yeah, so you can put a fold pad on that. Yeah. I would think, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's there. And my questions. Cool. Carol, right. I have a... What else I do have you a... want to... Go ahead. 
Uh, this is Marta. I did uh, last year Formic Pro on the double nook successfully, but I did use the one pad method twice. Um, the only, the only uh, limitation is you have to really open the, um, the entrance completely. I think that's where the mortality comes from. I, th I agree with you. So, so one thing I want to say before we leave, any kind of treatment that you put on your colony, you must follow the instructions and, and they, they have tested with, you know, restricted entrances and found out that that's not a good thing to do. So yeah, as, as Marta is saying, you have to have that entrance open and um, uh, for the duration of the, of the um, test. And I have screen bottom boards. Is that gonna be a problem? I should cover those? Um, so when I do any kind of a treatment, oxalic acid or formic acid, I slide a little thing in here and make mm -hmm. believe, you know, it, it sort of converts it into a, uh, a solid bottom board. Okay, I got it, thank you. But, you know, you can also treat without that and you can vaporize with screen bottom boards also, so. Mm -hmm. All right, so listen, unless there's another burning question, I'm gonna see you guys on, um, on the 19th. If you're coming to the yard, ER, please, um, if, you're, if your membership is expired or, um, or anything else, please renew it. I, we appreciate your support. All of your money that you give us goes right back to you in beekeeping um, events and guest speakers and so on and so forth. Um, so this is one of the only places where, and if you want to donate some money to CBA, please do. Um, uh, yes. Do they have um, a TIN number? Uh, no. No? No, no, we don't. No, um, we're a um, 501c3b or something, which uh, which is another issue completely, but you're, <coughs> you're, um, <clears throat> you're, um, you can donate and we'll appreciate it. That's okay. what I say about that. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, no problem. Uh, okay. All right. So um, thank you all for coming. This was just a very stimulating uh, B Talks um, for me also, and I hope for you. And I want to encourage you guys to use tonight's B Talks as a model for participation because we had great, great comments and questions from everybody. I'm sorry that I didn't do the current thing of saying you, that was a great question. Um, because I forget about saying that, but I actually mean it in my heart. So you got to, you have to know that. All right. And we are here for one primary purpose, and that's to teach beekeeping. And I don't know all the answers, but collectively we do know most of what it takes to raise bees healthy. And as the more we cooperate with each other, uh, the better we'll all be in the long run. So with that sort of diatribe of please, I will say good night and thanks again for coming. Thanks, and Phil. If you make it on the 19th, please do.